So the subject that I'd like to talk with you about is not really about the future of chemistry. It's more about the future of the university as an enterprise and to some extent the future of corporations. And the point of greatest interest to me in this is the following, that one has in a corporation a well understood idea of what a corporation does, which is to take in money to produce jobs, goods, and services, and to return to those who put in the original money more money. That's called capitalism. What the university does is a little bit vaguer, because we take in money that is in the form of largely grants from the federal government, and what we produce is certainly students, and sometimes good scientific papers and new ideas, and sometimes technology. And the question is, do we have the balance right? And I'm not going to spend much time on corporations because the issue there, I think, has to do in large part with the time over which you integrate the return on investment. You know, in the Goldman Sachs world, you're, you take in money and you really would like to get the money back plus 20% after tax in about six months. That may not be either possible or even the best way of doing it. But a different subject. The university, what should the university do? And the question of what a university does is typically phrased in terms of two antipodes. And these are often called curiosity-driven research and problem-driven research, or fundamental and applied, or there are a number of different ways of putting it that way. What I would submit to you is that there's a third way of doing it, which is both. That is, it combines the two, and in many circumstances, it has a better outcome for everyone than either A or B. So let me expand on this a little bit. The argument in the university for curiosity-driven re research often devolves to a single point, which is called quantum mechanics. And the notion with quantum mechanics is that in a time in which there was basically no application for quantum mechanics, brilliant people, Schrodinger, Dirac, all the rest of them, went off and developed quantum mechanics and, in fact, changed the world in, in one of the most profound of ways. Absolutely true. And for those of you who are graduate students or postdocs, if you can tell me that you are going to develop quantum mechanics, I personally will write you the check to do this because I think it's a very good investment. Then the other sort of view is, for example, polymer chemistry, where polymer chemistry is everywhere. It introduced a new form of matter, and by introducing a new form of matter, it made it possible to fabricate all kinds of things with economics and applications that you couldn't otherwise do. And so then the argument has been phrased in terms of, do you want to solve a problem because that has a particular set of characteristics, or is human curiosity really what's driving things? Let me step back for just a moment and do something which may offend some of you, but forgive me, and that is to follow the money. And what I mean by this is the following argument, that in the university, we in the university who do research take money largely from whatever the federal government might be in order to do something. We do research with it. Where does the money come from? The money comes from our citizens, our fellow taxpayers, who, which might be corporations, it might be individuals, who pay money to the government in the form of taxes for two reasons. One is they go to jail if they don't. And the second is that they have a kind of expectation that by doing so, we will somehow make the world a better place. So the question then is, do we have an obligation to the people who pay the money? And the answer is, I th seems to me, absolutely yes. And I don't think very many people would argue with that. The question is not, do we have an obligation to the people who support us, but rather, is that obligation best served by just doing what happens to be easy and interesting to do, or is it best served by asking what, does it, what really needs to be done? What's the problem? versus what do we, are we curious about. And I think there are arguments in both cases, but 
the argument that I like is the one that says that if you're going to do curiosity-driven research, you must have a curiosity. And not everyone does. And so, fine. So some people have curiosity and some people don't. If you want to do applications-driven research, um, you need an application. There's never a problem with problems to be solved. I mean, there are an enormous number of problems to be solved. And I will say for chemistry that many of the problems are now chemical problems, and I'll return to that in a moment. So it doesn't say that there's an A or B that's better, but rather that they have different characteristics. But one of the things which I think is a matter of policy and actually a very interesting one to think about in the university is, can't you do both? And this is called in the United States the Pasteur Quadrant problem. And the, you know, the basic idea is that someone put together a two by two matrix which along one axis has um, innovativeness, new idea, newness of an idea, and along the other axis, utility. So something that was very interesting and new was quantum mechanics, and that's given the name Bohr. Something that was very useful was light bulbs, and that's given the name Edison. And then the Pasteur quadrant is the quadrant that says there are problems that are important problems that need to be solved, for which there is no science, so that you also have to solve, invent the science if you're going to solve the problem. And Pasteur is given credit for this because Pasteur did two interesting things. One was pasteurization, because at the time that Pasteur noted that milk spoiled and food spoiled, there was no real understanding of why it did so. And he had an early microscope, and he saw the little animals running around in the milk, and he found experimentally that if you heated the milk, the little animals didn't run around very much longer, and actually the milk lasted longer. That's called pasteurization. And it's actually made a big difference, but it also is the beginning of applied microbiology. And Pasteur was also a very early uh, person experimenting with vaccination. So he's sometimes called the father of applied immunology. What he did was to look first at a big problem and then to look at the science that was required to solve that problem. And the question, I think, for universities is in part, are you better off doing research that has that characteristic of producing ideas as opposed to products simply by inventing science and then hoping that somebody out there at some point can find a use for it? Or are you better off having a vector which said, here's a problem, I don't know how to solve it, what do I have to do? And my argument very quickly is that for most of us, it's actually easier to be creative if you're faced with trying to solve a problem for which you don't know the solution than if you're trying to find a way of moving something you already know how to do a step forward. So it's not a question of curiosity versus solving a problem, but rather that trying to solve a problem stimulates curiosity. Creativity comes from the combination of the two. That's all. Now, an interesting point in asking about this is, should one then consider that part of the university output should be the solution to problems? And the question that you then ask is, are there problems? And some years ago, I went to a meeting on ethics in nanotechnology. It was in a nice place in France, excellent food, there were 200 ethicists and one or two scientists, me. I don't know why I was there. But we very quickly understood that there were essentially no ethical problems in nanotechnology. So the question was, how did we justify spending the rest of the weekend there with the nice wine and the nice food? And that was a, a practical problem. But the ethicists went away, and, and we all thought, we ethicists all thought deep scientific thoughts about this, and decided that if you looked at the problems that the world had been solving, there had been a period when physics basically ruled the roost because physics from physics came electronics, came the computer, came nuclear weapons, came a whole series of things that really made enormous difference in how the world ran. And then there was a period, you could argue, in which electrical engineers had their day. And there was a period in which DNA was going to solve all of our problems with health. And each of these things had happened. But if you look at the problems now, environmental stewardship, how do we keep 
oceans and atmospheres running. The management of megacities. How do we run 50 million people safely to protect them from disease, give them food? How do we do all that kind of thing? Public health versus end of life. I mean, arguably in the United States, one of the key issues is the problem of a healthcare system which by every metric is not a particularly good one, but is without any question the most expensive one on the planet. Is that the right way of doing things? And by the way, I hold myself proudly in front of you as an example of the public health system because 50 years ago or 100 years ago, I'd be dead. And why am I here? And it's not because of chest crackers and vaccination, chest crackers and other things, it's because of vaccination and traffic lights and airbags and rule of law and a whole bunch of things like this stuff, much of it that you don't even associate with public health. So what, what I think you can very easily do is to put together a list of 20 things from job creation and stabilization, new kinds of products, ways of distributing information, education, every one of which will have components in chemistry and material science and things of that sort. So those of you who are chemists, you're covered. If you're in electronics, you're obviously covered. If you're in biology and healthcare, you're obviously covered. We're all in it together. The only question is, what's the model? Do we do things only from the point of view of problem, or do we think, do things only from the point of view of curiosity, or we do things from picking a really important problem and then inventing whatever science? And my argument is the last is best. But I would close by saying that if you think about the quadrant that I've drawn, which is pure curiosity, pure applications, and then a combination of the two, there's a blank quadrant which is down in the lower left-hand corner, which is neither interesting nor useful. And in Washington, that's often called the university quadrant. And we don't want to do that. That is not the right place to be. So those of you who are young are going to have to think about how to manage this problem. But I think that the underlying idea of saying that in a university, your only job is to publish papers, advance your career, and do whatever is the next paper in the line of 127 papers is probably less interesting, less good for society, less stimulating scientifically, less useful technologically than looking at big problems and looking at new science to solve. Say, say so. Thank you very much.